I, what it makes me think of with Pointing Labs, um, Robert Ruark wrote uh, Horn of the Hunter about going over to uh, Africa and doing a big safari for a couple months. And, you know, the book is awesome, like a lot of stuff he wrote about. But there's one part in there where they were lion hunting. And I'm paraphrasing here because I haven't read this in a while. But he said, you know, they'll they'll be driving along and they'll ask the natives like, hey, have you seen any big Maine lions lately? And the natives will always say, yeah, you know, over the hill, we saw this big lion yesterday. Or if you're elephant hunting, they'll say, oh, man, there's there's bulls over there with 90 pound tusks. And their whole idea is even if they haven't seen that big elephant or they haven't seen the the lions, the idea is you might drive over the hill, see a great big elephant or a lion, shoot it and come back and give them some kind of tip. And they're like, we don't know if there's elephants over there. And I think about this with pointing labs because there's probably people out there that are like, yeah, these labs will point. Like maybe they'll point, you know, like they could be just saying that to get you to buy in. And who knows, maybe those labs will point. But that's not that's not the person you want to be buying the dog from. Correct. So tell me a little bit about training yeah because i'm curious about you know somebody goes and gets a gsp there's a hundred million resources to figure out how to train it um is is training a pointing lab and and i know you said you don't train them to point but is training a pointing lab is there anything special about that or are you doing this the way you train other pointers uh yes the biggest thing about a pointing lab training program is how to balance between the upland field and the retriever work. Okay, so when we go to a test in the very same day that we're running the test, we have to turn them loose in the upland field and know now it's your job. Go use your nose, do the thing, do your hunting. And uh, then we turn around on the same note. Now you turn into my obedient retriever and you run a straight line to this mark or to this blind right through the same cover that they were just and not turn on the hunt mode on you in the middle of the test you know so being able to balance it may t take a little bit longer to get a pointing lab i guess where you want them due to that balance so mm -hmm. if i was just to take a retriever take the upland field away from the i could take that retriever and and take it and really do well at a young age in this retriever world or i can take this and i'm going to just do upland with this dog very quickly i can turn this into a phenomenal upland dog at a very young age but then start putting the two pieces together and making them perform both functions in the same day multiple times on one weekend you know it really takes some maturity and a balanced program because you can overdo one and it affects your other side of your program one and vice versa so balancing out the training program there's a few good resources out there and there is some just like any industry some people that have put out stuff that really don't know what they're talking about too if you find a reliable breeder take recommendations from your breeder where to send your dog yep. they know who who can handle them and who's doing the right things with them in the industry julie knutson training the pointing labrador is one of the best resources that i can recommend for anybody that's going to get a pointing lab phenomenal resource as far as being able to balance between two programs Yep, she's she is a very well recognized uh, pointing lab authority. Um, when you're saying so, finding the balance between the upland work and the retrieving work, um, I think I think this is similar. I mean, we we run into this, you know, with a typical flushing lab all the time. If if you were only hunting pheasants, working that dog and getting that dog to understand how its manners have to be out there in the pheasant field. Is, is not that difficult. They know how, they know they like the scent of pheasants. They know they like to kick them up. They know they like to retrieve yep. them. The hard part is, is having a dog that will do that and then having a dog that will sit in the duck blind next to you and wait and be steady or sit at home when you tell it to place and a stranger knocks on the door and comes yep. in and they want to get all the love. Is that what you're talking about a little bit here? Absolutely. When you're training the dogs, a standard is so important. Okay, so one... The best example I can give of that standard is, so I get a call from a client and the dog jumps on the company. My first question out of my mouth is who in the family allows the dog to jump? Kid, grandma, mom, 
but somebody in the family has allowed the dog to, to jump on them. Because if the standard across the board is no jumping, company can walk into that house and that dog will not jump on, on them. But if a dog is allowed to do it in one place one way and not the other, then it comes down to the individual person setting that standard with the dog. So dog listens to dad, but doesn't listen to mom. Then there's a standard level not being held consistently with that dog. And that follows right on into the hunting field. If there's inconsistency at home, you're going to have inconsistency in the field. So there's a lot of pieces and a lot of cogs that have to line up when you put an AKC master hunter or, or finish title in United Kennel. Um, you know, these dogs are winning multiple titles in multiple organizations. You know, um, we run a lot of finished in United Kennel now with HRC. Um, and yet these dogs can go out and win the grand and turn around and run an American Pointing Lab trial or go run Bird Dog Challenge and won, win the open pointing division. And it all comes down to consistency. If you want that level of a dog, your consistency across the board has to be there on your obedience. It starts at the obedience at, at home and in the field. And you will find that you're going to have a much more pleasurable hunt. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this is a topic that we've been exploring a lot lately where it's, it's basically how many sets of rules does that dog have? If it only has one set of rules across the board, you're going to have a rock star for a dog. If there's a set of rules for you and then a different set of rules for your wife, then that dog, you know, it's going to figure that out just like kids do. And I'll tell you something I noticed with my dog lately. Um, I take my, my lab out, um, couple times a day, you know, either in the backyard pond or in one of the neighborhood parks and we'll do different stuff. Sometimes we're working dummies. Sometimes it's just a steadiness thing. Sometimes it's just fun retrieves for her just to get some exercise. But one thing I started to notice, if I'm talking on the phone and I'm working my dog, she starts to push it. Like she, she figured out that if I'm on the phone, I'm probably not paying as close of attention as I should be. And she'll start to slip. And I'm like, God damn you, you figured this out on me. And, you know, like totally just without even thinking about it. And it, so intuitively it makes sense. Like, obviously I'm not paying as good of attention, but she, she saw that and she goes, he's, he's not going to care if I, if I'm, if I'm not rock solid, I can get away with this. And so not only, is it two sets of rules from two sets of people or two different people? We can, we can, as the primary trainer and owner, can be guilty of setting multiple sets of rules just depending on how we operate. So it pays to pay attention to that. Absolutely. Um, I, I can't preach consistency enough across the board. Um, they can be great citizens and obedient and still be rock stars in the hunting field. But it all, it's all about that consistency. For sure. For sure. Um, so tell me about if somebody if somebody wanted to get a puppy from you or somebody else, um, you'd recommend. I mean, are, are you looking at a wait period for that? Um, how many, like how, how easy is it out there right now in the market to find a really well-bred pointing lab? You're really well-bred pointing labs. You better plan on a six-month wait. Okay. Um, most of our females at our particular program are the litters are sold out before the females ever bred even, and so you need to plan six months ahead if you want to really be able to select a breeding and stuff that you want to want to have. Now, you will stumble onto some that you know that might not be quite six months out but i see pretty much pretty consistently all the big breeders that are well-known breeders there is a waiting list out there right now mm -hmm. but you can find one so it's not like you're gonna be you know it's not like you're waiting three years or something for a for a litter you know it's not a brock de auburn or some crazy breed that you can only find three breeders in the country but you're still not going to be able to decide today that i want a, a good pointing lab and go find one tomorrow. You're not going to go Google that up and just make it happen, right? 
no, it, it really, it's not going to happen. Um, you need to plan your time, you know, at least three months. And I would recommend six months ahead of when you would like to get a dog. You know, you need to be doing your research and getting on a waiting list somewhere. So is there anything, because it, it, here's something that, that, I shouldn't I shouldn't be doing this podcast because I talk to people all the time and it drives me nuts that I'll you know after this conversation with you I'm going to be like I should probably get a pointing lab and it happens to me all the time where I'll interview somebody and I've never considered that kind of dog like an English cocker spaniel or something and I'll talk to somebody who's a you know a breed enthusiast trainer whatever and I'm like ah now I kind of want that is there is there any type of uh, of hunter or any type of dog owner who you would steer away from a pointing lab for some reason? Not ne- really. If they're a hunter, okay. Um, you know, if they're a hunter, the natural traits and the prey drive, you know, that's what makes a great dog. You've got to have that in their background. Is that hunting background? Um, would I? recommend not necessarily even a pointing lab if you live in the city and got nowhere to exercise that dog and and give a lab the ample exercise that they need because they will drive you crazy they're so smart they want an an activity and now we sell a lot of our pointing labs outside of the pointing lab world we have a ton of bomb dogs involved in our program Um, we have um service dogs uh we have therapy dogs in our industry we've even got some that are in the seizure world so the intelligence of the pointing lab or the labrador retriever is really there for about everything but you have to realize you have to have a job for them Mm -hmm. whether you know what industry you take that dog into that would be you know the dog's job but they want to learn you can take a litter of puppies and you can have first pick on that litter of puppies and you sit there and look at that puppy for six months and the guy that got the last puppy in the litter went to work and introduced birds and got that puppy going and then asked me ask me at six months who's got the best dog well who who what you put into it you know yeah. time and effort that's who's got the best dog at any one in point so and here's a good example that i i like to give as a reference and people kind of can do it. so say you've got four dogs that's four pieces of clay clay's got all the components the pedigree the ingredients the prey drive that you're wanting your dog to have the clay's an artist can take that piece of clay and put it on a spinning wheel well the four artists are sitting there looking at their pieces of clay trying to decide how what they want to do with it the first guy starts it he makes a mistake and it falls apart and tips over on his spinning wheel but he picks it back up and he still can make this into a a phenomenal end product and then you got the guy that put the piece of clay on the pot and can't decide what to do with it and he just sits and looks at it then you got the guy that got it all together and he made this beautiful pot the first shot and he's wowing himself dog is the same thing it's what you put into it you will make mistakes but a dog is so forgiving that you can recover from that and still go on and do it Mm -hmm. and and so my clay scenario is just kind of a way to show that it's what you do with these dogs and what you put into them that creates this loving working dog that everybody wants so i'm glad you brought that up because you know, we get hit up all the time. Like, okay, I, I kind of understand this, this pedigree research. I kind of understand this due diligence. And I don't want the listeners to think that's the answer to all their problems. And what you just said is that's, that's like a hedge your bets thing to have the best chance provided you put in the work. So you can give yourself a hell of an advantage by doing the right research and talking to the right people to find the dog that fits into your life for whatever you want to do with it, whatever kind of job you're going to give it. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end up with driving home that seven week old puppy. That's, that's just the start (laughs) of it. You got a lot left to do. And I, you know, I've asked a lot of trainers like, 
you know, what, what should we tell people they really need to focus on for training? Like how long? And it seems pretty consistently. It's like, you, you got to think about that and be doing that with that dog in whatever kind of little drills you're working on for two years till that dog's two years old. And then you might start to see all of this stuff really coming together. And then it's, it's experience, you know, the more experience you can get it based on that two-year foundation you've built. And of course you should be getting an experience younger than that, but that's when a lot of people say you start seeing them turn that corner where you're like, man, I don't have to say a whole lot to this dog and this dog is doing what it's supposed to. Absolutely. And that's, that, that's a wonderful thing to see. So you have, you have people coming to you who are ending up using dogs, uh, bomb sniffing dogs and therapy dogs and all, all kinds of these, I guess, kind of non-traditional roles for labs, which, which seem to be coming, a uh, fair be, becoming fairly common lately where you're seeing labs handle these things that maybe we saw just you know canines straight out of germany or uh very specific breeds handling it seems like labs are ending up in a lot of different roles these days they are uh and it goes back to that versatility and and i really call it the prey drive you know a good working dog without good prey drive won't succeed in any any of the fields bomb you know service dog cadaver dogs um hunting dogs you know that's what drives that dog to search and retrieve and and do what it's bred to do we donated one to the colorado parks and wildlife for their canine unit here they have taught him 18 different scents he they are using him to go out and do counts on the endangered toads and ferrets and because he will alert on these scents when they find him. Okay, we do. This is an active hole. He's alerting on it. They're using him for the game checks at, during hunting season to pick up the different scents of the game. Fish, they'll walk him down the beach, and if he stops at a cooler, Okay, let's see what's in that cooler. That gives them the right to search, you know, if that dog alerts on something. So they're using this dog. But like I said, 18 different scents they've taught this dog in the field, in the canine world with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And I I don't know about you, but I bet you if they had the time and the resources, they could train that dog to signal on 180 different scents. Yeah. Yeah. And it, which is which is incredible. I mean, it's just it's just a matter of getting that dog to understand. Okay, when you get a whiff of this, this is what we want you to do. Yeah. And and that that kind of stuff is fascinating. I've I've got a buddy who's a conservation officer uh, here in Minnesota, and he's he's had various dogs throughout his career. You know, personal dogs that he trains to do that kind of stuff. And, you know, he had, I know he had a dog at one point that he duck hunted with a lot and he'd take it when he was checking duck hunters. And when he's checking them, he send that dog out and say hunt dead to see if they stashed any in the, (laughs) in the brush or they maybe got over their limit a little bit or something. And he's, you know, it obviously didn't happen with everybody, but every once in a while that dog would find an extra wood duck or something that they had uh, tucked away. And I I think that stuff's just fascinating. Um, Anything, anything. Oh, I remember. I was going to ask you one more thing about, uh, about working with pointing labs in the field. So on, you know, we hear a lot about when you're, when you're working just any kind of pointers, like training them to honor points. Um, how, how are the labs you work with? How are they? If you, if you're running them with another dog? Normally pretty good. Um, I personally don't train for the honoring side of it. But I catch my dogs doing it all the time naturally in the field. Um, I was out with a guy that was running short hairs, and Max backed up his pointer. Next time, Max went on point, and the short hair backed him. And I got pictures of them reversing the roles in the field that day. Um, I've got pictures of my labs backing each other, and I've never trained a back one time in my entire life. So you know that has to be a natural trait that shows up whether you're training it or not you know when i'm working the upland field with these dogs it's birds 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 you know Mm -hmm. the more birds they see the stronger they're going to get and the more they understand it um 
we go through the exact, you can pick up any wool breaking book, use the barrel, use the board, use the table that the out there. Our labs go through the exact same wool program as any of the pointing breed people do. So mm -hmm. any of the wool programs, you can pick up that information, but it's critical. And that's where your steady to wing and shot comes from. You don't wall them into a point. They have to establish point on their own. But once they're on point, I can go, whoa, walk up past them, shoot the bird. And because you're on a wall, that means you're not to move. Just like a sit whistle in the retriever world. If I give yep. you a sit whistle, you don't move. If I give you a wall in the upland field, you don't move. Um, I can throw them a retrieve and as they're coming back with that retrieve, if I say, whoa, they'll just freeze right there. And I don't even have to, you know, I can give the whistle and they'll sit, but I can actually give them a whoa command and they'll just freeze right in their tracks. Mm -hmm. And so I put them through a whoa program, just like they do the pointing breeds. Yeah. Um, so, so that's part of their upland training. Um, so I, one more question for you on that. Um, I, I, I was thinking when you said this earlier, you said you don't train your dogs to point. And I see lots of people with pointers training them with a, you know, a pheasant wing or a grouse wing on a fishing rod, you know, dragging it ahead of them, that little puppy and the puppy will lock in for a few seconds. And I've had pointer trainers tell me they don't like that because now you're working on a visual point versus the scent. Um, but you said you don't train to point. I mean, do you have any opinion on that? What's, um, I will occasionally pull out a wing on a pole when I'm trying to evaluate a litter at eight weeks old, because if they're stalking the wing versus just running after it, that's a pointing trait starting to show up. Mm -hmm. So I look for that stalking at eight weeks old, but beyond that, I do not use a pole. Okay. So it's just an evaluation tool on the litter to see if any of them are showing early sign of point. You know, one thing people want to realize is because they do carry a little bit of flushing in them still that sometimes the point shows up at eight weeks. Sometimes it shows up at eight months. You know, typically if you've got a strong line, it's going to show up mm -hmm. some of it, but because that flushing trait is there, if somebody's shooting every bird that that dog puts in the air, you just told him that that's the easier way to go than to stand there and hold point and wait for me to get there. Mm -hmm. So they're going to take the easy way out. So you can almost train the point away more than you can train the point in. And so we, I'll let them drag a check cord as a puppy. I don't really control, hold them with that, but if, if they lock up on point, then I try to get up there and step on it. So they don't dive into the bird. So they start learning. Oh, once I go on point, I got to hold it until you get there and th then we let them go get the retrieve. But if they just keep crashing the bird, they get to watch it fly away. You know, I'll check them up here or there saying, no, see, this is what you got to do. You know, and almost all of them, if I give them one little check and just slow them down one step, they're going to, they lock up solid mm -hmm. for me. Um, but it's just that energy of a puppy, you know, that, oh, this is fun and exciting. I want to get it. No, you still have to wait for me to walk past you and put the bird up. 